Welcome folks to another episode of Tiffin Box TV. I speak with photography industry leaders who make it a habit of inspiring others, bridging craft and commerce to help you create a sustainable and creative business. Today's guest is a decorated photojournalist, teacher and author. Steve Raymer is a former National Geographic photographer and is prolific now as a as a photography book producer. I, is that is that the good way to describe you, Steve? I, I guess uh, the, uh, the author because you're uh, not you're, you're of, nonstop of, with books now. Yeah, this is uh, the most recent book is about number seven, I guess. Yes. And, uh, uh, and I did many of these as an Indiana University professor. You know, a second career as a professor after National Geographic. But uh, uh, as we were talking about before, uh, the, you know, as we were talking. Um, my my first dean at Indiana University suggested to me, he said, you've got to find some way to get tenure and get promoted through the academic ranks. And he said, my advice to you, his name is Trevor Brown. He's retired now, but he's a giant in the field of journalism education. Uh, Trevor Brown said to me, Steve, keep doing what you did at National Geographic, because many of those National Geographic assignments took you a year or more to photograph uh, and report. And in, but instead of chasing magazine articles, uh, which would be a bad thing at the age of 50, um, turn these lo this long form reportage into books. And so as a professor outside of the classroom, um, I have been lucky to have been at a for 21 years at, until I retired uh, at a un major research university that counted creative work at a certain international level. Uh, as equivalent to research. So I did books about the Muslim world of Asia and about the global Indian diaspora, about Calcutta, uh, about Vietnam as a country today that's at peace with itself for the most part and, and with its neighbors and is prospering in many ways. Um, uh, and gee, you know, I, I've got a book going right now about the endangered and disappearing pubs of Great Britain, which is kind of a nice change of pace after, uh, say, Calcutta uh, or Kolkata, which was probably the biggest professional challenge of my career to deal with that poverty that you see on the streets and then go beyond that to see what is, what is what's India's intellectual uh, capital like today. And so, you, you know, that's a long winded answer of saying, yes, the author of photographic books um, is kind of one of my stock and trade jobs these days in and Seishu. Well, that's great. You know, one of the things that uh, I remember uh, you telling me uh, when I was a student of yours, uh, <laughs> And I and we go Almost way way back. Ten years ago, yes. I know. I think you were just starting out at Indian University by that exactly. uh, by, by that time. Uh, so this is a good twenty years ago. This yeah. was a good twenty years ago. Yeah. I was there from 19, 9, 1995 until two thousand, the end of two thousand sixteen. So right. it was a real second career. Uh, indeed, indeed. And uh, I remember the two of us. Either you had a Leica or I had a Leica. I think you had a Leica uh, M series camera, uh, which, uh, in a lot of ways, is still there's great virtue in the rangefinder camera and its inconspicuousness and kind of the need to find the perfectly composed, decisive moment that we talked about sure. so much in class. You know. Yeah. So one of the things you you mentioned when I was there, uh, and I remember this rather vividly, is about how much. Uh, we photograph and especially with assignments uh, whether it was school generated or self generated um, it was all about and this is one project I remember doing at a local mosque and I came back with my my uh, my contact sheets and you looked through them and you looked up and you said very 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 kindly of course you said you haven't shot enough <laughs> or something to that effect where you were like you haven't gone far enough, uh, and I'm always I'm always curious about a book project like this one. And we I failed to mention the name of the book. And it's called Somewhere West of Lonely. Um, yes, I I've got a copy. There right? you go. That's it right there. there. It's it's uh, a visual a visual memoir with sixty five thousand words of text. Right. Um, but uh, somewhere west of lonely, the um, actually I owe that credit to. Uh, 
a, a great pal who was best man at our wedding. He's since deceased. But when we were uh, working on a documentary or a long uh, reporting project on the construction of the Alaska pipeline, we flew out to western Alaska in a helicopter, or at least that was our intention, to talk with the Alaska native people about uh, the coming of big oil and big money and how, the li- how their lives were going to be impacted. And somewhere west of Lonely, we Lonely is a place on the map. You can find it. It's got a zip code. It's a ballistic missile early warning uh, site run by the U.S. Air Force. But somewhere west of Lonely, we ran into a terrible whiteout storm where we were just enveloped in um, in this uh, in snow and ice and so forth, and turned around and we couldn't land at Lonely because it was too dangerous, and we sort of outran the storm. But I think it's the title is a pretty good metaphor for many of us who spent a lot our careers as magazine photographers um, out in the field, uh, separated from the office and our loved ones, uh, and on a very sort of, until the advent of the mobile phone, on a very thin and tenuous cord, um, uh, and really having to operate independently and, and depend upon your understanding of the story and the initiative. But, you know, we were talking before we uh, started recording about the importance of words. And um, my background is sort of uh, as a writer as well as a photographer. And I think that the more we can verbalize or the more we can um, express what it is we're trying to do and why this is important and, you know, kind of get the who, what, why, where, when, and how and understand the story in a verbal context, the better our pictures are going to be. And when you mention your contact sheet from the local mosque here in Bloomington, um, you know, we just have to force ourselves to get into the story and find and dig deeper and find out, well, what's the meaning here? What, what is this place all about? And as you know, and, and we hope that our audience will um, be inspired by this maybe a little bit that, that, um, you know, once over lightly uh, doesn't work. Just because you've got a few good pictures, um, it doesn't mean that you have gone to the heart of the story. And so let, let me ask you, is how do you know, after being in the geographic, after teaching at IU, that you are in the heart of the story? Like, what is it that indicates to you or gives you that little... You know, is it is it a red flag that pops up that says, no. "Yeah, I'm here." Says you, uh, it, it's panic. It's panic. <laughs> okay. and, and, and you know, very. I don't know how many photographers or photojournalists admit to panic, but it is when you've worked so hard, right? And you wonder what else is there to do? What can I do to make this come alive? And sometimes, says you, I have found that that panic mode, when you is is. Uh, uh, it really can propel your creative juices. Sometimes it's to feel like, well, I'm done uh, at other times. And I can think of an example in Bangkok, Thailand, where I was doing a whole story on uh, the country of Thailand. And I got a, in the days of fax or telegrams, I guess it was a fax from my picture editor saying, we sh- I showed your pictures to all the higher ups and everybody loved your coverage of Thailand and you're done um, come on home. And uh, I had to wait a day or two to get a plane ticket home. And I got up early in the morning and went to a local uh, Buddhist uh, temple. And here was a young couple with their little MG, and they were feeding the monks as the monks would come to mm-hmm. receive their alms. And when the pressure was off, and I thought I was done, and I, this has happened so many times in my career. When the pressure was off and I thought I was done and just enjoying making pictures, bam, there was the lead picture for the story. It was still in my camera when I got, and I got back to Washington. I thought, I better get this roll of film developed. And here was the lead picture, the first picture, the double page uh, in the story. So, so to some extent, it's the panic mode when you think, now I've really got to focus here. What else is there to do? Sometimes it's when you relax and say, you know, I think I've done everything that's on my list. And, um, you know, you just, you know, look around and, um, and, there, and use your visual kind of skills um, 
and enjoy uh, seeing. I think that's a kind of an unusual concept for those of us who go out and have to be a professional seer um, when we can just enjoy it. Sometimes we're a little more per- perceptive. Well, that, you know, that's a wonderful explanation as to how to sort of sense that you're there. And I yeah. think uh, uh, it, that comes from experience. Obviously, it's, it, you know, the first time you go out there, you're liable to miss things and you're probably going to come back saying, oh, I got it. But you may not have really truly got it. So you got to go back out again and again and again until you just sort of uh, it's like a it's like a muscle. You got to keep exercising almost. It, right. It's, it's true. And and of course, as magazine photographers or as today uh, doing long, any kind of long form reporting, um, whether it's for a newspaper or a magazine or a website, where we have the luxury, unlike a newspaper photographer, we have the luxury of going back again to try to get some, get a better image. Um, I think that persistence, if you can just kind of try to define what makes your work good, persistence is one of those important uh, attributes is you've got to be unsatisfied with your work you've got to be you've got to be the toughest editor of your own work and say i can do something better i know that i can do something better there's one picture in my book from st petersburg russia if i can quickly find it um of uh, palace square um which is one of the world's large public spaces and i know maybe i'll have trouble finding it. oh yes uh, my my new book Pal- here from Palace Square mm-hmm. in uh, Saint Petersburg, Russia. Uh, now I was doing a book and a magazine article at the same time on Saint Petersburg. So this is not like a newspaper photographer having to produce something for tomorrow morning's website or something. I went back 42 times to Palace Square through the summer when the light was really pretty awful and remember that light is our single most important storytelling element but in the late autumn i just wandered over there one night and i was uh, you know there was this really beautiful uh and and pretty strong autumn light coming out of the baltic sea and then standing there with my leica and 21 millimeter lens and i'll never forget this come two horseback riders cook copping through the frame and it looked like the 18th or 19th century and Tsar Peter the Great was probably just around the corner and bam, you know um, anybody could have taken the picture because the light and the composition was just right But yeah, so I guess that idea of not being quite satisfied with your work or maybe never being satisfied with your work it's okay to be your, your toughest critic uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, process I think one of the things that uh, uh, maybe a bit of a mystery for a lot of photographers who are either starting out or have been doing this for a while, but have looked at National Geographic magazine and uh, just the, the the breadth and depth of uh, photographs in there that just sort of suggest that obviously, you know, you've spent a lot of time with your subjects, uh, they've gotten to know you, you've gotten to know them, uh, and access is not an issue anymore. But for somebody who's who's got to make it happen, make it quickly happen, and and you you know you were uh, at the Milwaukee Journal for many many years as well, right? And you had to make well, photographs happen, right? Yeah, I was at the, uh, at the Milwaukee Journal through undergraduate and graduate school. I was right. one of their uh, well in the summer a real photographer in the win- uh, during the school year. I was sort of in, I was in Madison, yeah. Wisconsin, where there was the active. Yep. Anti-war movement, uh, you know, sort of the protests against the mm-hmm. Vietnam War helped pay for my undergraduate or, and uh, education. Um, you do need that quick eye to yeah. uh, s- to say this is worth my time. You need that eye to be eva- to evaluate that there's something here that's really visually interesting and compelling. And you you know you need to as we talked many times in, when you were a student, you need to see the picture in your mind's eye. The camera is simply the tool to right. capture. But you know you need to kind of see that picture right there and say there's a there is something worth doing. Um, and and I'm not sure today access is is more difficult. I think because people are more suspicious of us either internationally or certainly at home here in the United States. People are more suspicious of why are you photographing. Um, uh, 
but yeah, um, I forget your original question. Well, I, I didn't quite ask it because uh, I guess I was formulating is that the idea is that you know, even the cover photograph of your book, uh, there's that intimacy, there's that, you know, the, the sense that the person you're photographing has allowed you to be yeah. in their space. Uh, my question to you is, how do you get there? How do you get to that point where they're comfortable with you and you're so comfortable with them that you can step up to them uh, within a foot's distance and make a portrait that just, you know, sings? Uh, well, it's a hard thing to define and a hard thing to teach, the idea of intimacy. But I think the more that you can uh, step into someone else's shoes and uh, for, understand, for example, that uh, little boy or boy, uh, young man on the cover of my book, mm -hmm. he and I couldn't communicate. He spoke a, a, a local language of nomadic reindeer herders. But, uh, it, you know, to, to, go, to go up and say, it's cold, uh, with a smile, to be seen as a person of goodwill, to, be, to reassure people that you are there to tell their story and not to objectify them but to 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 tell their story that um you're not threatening a smile goes a long way says you it really does and to be able to uh, you know i in the case of my this cover photograph i i said a few words in russian to try to reassure this young man that uh, uh i was not a, a threat to him that yes i'm a a, a big american with a, even a big fat american with even a bigger camera but to uh, you know, to try to reassure him and say, "Oh, it's 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 cold and so forth, blah blah blah." But you know, you've got such a you know to compliment people to uh, to say, you know, um, gee, that's a wonderful smile you have, or uh, you know, your face tells so much to the people who read my magazine or whatever. To be able to put people at ease with some some actual words, to be able to talk to people, and I think the real skill set that is missing today or is more difficult for young people is that young people don't interview people. They don't have the reporter's skill to um, uh, put pe that puts people at ease and ask kind of the questions that are going to make people come alive because so much uh, is done by text and uh, email and so forth that uh, we those verbal skills kind of aren't as go undeveloped. I remember once in Bahrain, a small island off of the coast of Saudi Arabia, but it's 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 a, 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 a it's its own country. It's an independent country um, with a, an emir or a king. Anyway, and I was with the king's falconer, the keeper of the king's hunting and fighting falcons, and the light, the sun was disappearing on the horizon, and I had about two or three minutes with this guy. And he spoke excellent English, at least, an old, older man, and he had this falcon on his arm. And I said to him, kind of the, re the I, I asked him what any p reporter from the New York Times or the Hartford Courant would say, tell me what makes this bird a champion. And he just forgot about me. He forgot about the photographer in front of him. And he started to tell me what made the bird a champion. I would, he was he was in his, his world, and I right. was privy to it. So I think just that's a long way of saying that we need to develop our verbal skills and our reporting skills, our, our way of, of putting people at ease with a smile and small talk, and then to be able to talk to people about their life and their world. And I think the more we can do that as journalists, the closer we get to people and it, 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 it just, you suddenly have that intimacy that, you know, the wall is down. I love that. I love what you just said. However, uh, reality is uh, papers are dwindling. And I was going to ask you, with the with the papers going down and de uh, or downsizing and, and, and eliminating photo staff, photo staff. Yeah, right? what is going to happen to places like the National Geographic? Because a lot of the photographers who came to the National Geographic came from the newspaper world. My right. whole group of photographers, yeah. there were six of us hired uh, in the early 1970s, and we were, I don't want to say the new wave, but we were the ones who were supposed to help change the look of the magazine. What do we do when we don't have newspaper photo staffs? <clears throat> um, you know, there's no easy answer to this, Seishu. Um, I think that 
for young people, it's a ma- it, you know young people have to know that they need to develop entrepreneurial skills to be able to do a and a variety of kinds of pictures to be able to do journalism, to be able to do corporate portraits, to be able to do food, fashion, to be able to do things locally and nationally. Um, and they need their entrepreneurial skills to get the word out. You know, the, your website is your business card. It's your central marketing device uh, today. Um, some people are represented by agents if they're really good and then the agent gets you the assignment. But I think, um, uh, you know, the newspaper is not the training ground that it once was because we just have fewer newspapers and fewer newspaper photo staffs. But uh, that isn't to say that there aren't opportunities there. I am convinced, um, as I, I am convinced that the most talented and the most determined, and those are two different things, the most talented and the most determined uh, young people are going to do well in have a life in photography it may not be the life that i've had with a secure job on the staff of a big international magazine but national geographic doesn't have any staff photographers it's all freelance and these people who are doing stories some of them are young and they suggest an idea some of them are older and national geographic comes to them after they with their established reputations i think the thing to say to you you know in terms of advice is to find things that you're really interested in where you, where's your passion i mean it may i have a, a former student now she's a former student she's a ballet dancer but her passion really is for photographing dance and the ballet i and and you know i asked her to write a paper which sounds ridiculous for a photo instructor. I asked her to write a paper about the five great dance photographers of the 20th century. First of all, she had to round up five names and see what she could find. But in the end, she agreed that learning about people who've gone ahead of you makes a huge difference in how quickly you find your own voice and what's special about the way you see the world. You've just got to find that passion for what it is you've got to, you want to photograph. I have former students who make a wonderful living doing weddings. Now they're kind of weddings in the genre of photojournalism or documentary photography, but they're doing very, very well. And um, it's allowed also them to raise families. I think it's, it's finding that passion. If you don't have the passion, the camera isn't going to save you. There you go. I love it. Love that advice. Um, one question about uh, being an entrepreneur, though, um, and obviously uh, you have to be self-driven and motivated to be able to go out and get that, you know, and get that job or get that opportunity. Uh, being a professor of uh, a school like Indiana University, which has had a really long history in, as a leader in journalism uh, or teaching journalism, What do you feel journalism schools are doing to make things a little easier for their students before they graduate? Are they trying to, you know, introduce courses in business and marketing and sales and branding and finance, things like that? Or is it still all about, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, being able to write and produce, you know, short video clips and things like that, which... I guess it's great in the in the short run, but in the long run, you're like you're leaving sort of students hanging. Well, uh, not to put to, you on the spot there. No, no, no. To your point, Seishu, I've done a lot of thinking about this. I think, frankly, that a, a journalism student needs to have a broad liberal arts education so that they can think critically, so that they know something about the world, they know something about history and politics and sociology. I mean, I th- and and then, a f- you know, basic storytelling skills that are taught in schools of communication or journalism, those are important. But the, the you know, basic storytelling skills are one thing. Knowing how to operate some computer program or some piece of technology, that's always going to change. So I'd say that it's kind of a combination of the three, but I err on the side of the liberal arts. You know, if you have a passion for what it is you want to do, you're going to teach yourself how to work a video camera or how to work a still camera or 
blah, blah, blah. If you have a passion for telling stories, you're going to sort of naturally get that information in your notebook and transfer it um, onto paper. Um, I, I do think that we really fail on the entrepreneurial side. And if um, uh, in, in this day and age when higher education is in such flux, uh, we've got a, a, a trend toward more vocational education because parents want their kids to have a job when they graduate. So in, in some ways they want more skills. Um, uh, I, I want more liberal arts. I want more students who know what's going on in the world, more students who care about something because I know in the end the student who's going to get the job is the student who walks into someone's office with a personal project that shows where their mind is, where their passions are, where their instincts for an important story are. I know that personal project is going to get a student a job because it defines who they are, where their concerns are. Now, I think where we fall down in journalism education is the whole entrepreneurial side. How do you make money? How do you brand yourself? How do you define yourself? We really don't talk about this. We sort of assume that people are going to go out and get a job. And, and it's not, that's not the way it happens uh, anymore. So I think we really fall down on the entrepreneurial side. We also, I think, fall down and saying, well, if we t teach so many skills, you're fine. Seishu, I think most of us who are, I'm a self-taught photographer, and most of my colleagues at National Geographic were self-taught. Um, it's in my book in, in the first chapter. I uh, talk about my job interview at National Geographic, and here I was a few months out of graduate school, but I was a black and white newspaper photographer. And I get an invitation to come to National Geographic. And I, I'm hauling around this huge portfolio case of black and white pictures. And at the end of the day, I'm sitting across from Bob Gilka, the director of photography, who was known to be gruff and a man of few words. And outside his office was a, a sign that said, please wipe knees before entering. And uh, <laughs> that just sort of set the tone for going in his office. And I looked at, I said, Mr. Gilka, why am I here? I have never taken a color picture for publication. And he looked across those glasses and he said, it doesn't make a goddamn bit of difference. We can make the picture any damn color we want. And then without almost draw, draw, drawing a breath, he said, I'm hiring you for how you think and how you see the world, which I'm sure is advice I've passed on to you and your classmates. How yes. you think, how you yes. think, and how you see the world. So that sort of means that you care about what's going on in the world, that you can think critically and originally, and that your view of the world is different from your classmates. It's different from the person um, down, you know, down the street uh, who's also um, an avid photographer. Um, that's, I, I think there's, you know, it's such a simple key is to differentiate yourself. But, and this was taught in business school, but I wish it was taught more in the liberal arts and the humanities. Steve, uh, let's talk a little bit about the book, uh, which was sort of the initial premise of meeting up online. The book. The book, yes. The book. Um, it, it, and your dogs are telling you that they need to go out, I guess. Um, tell, tell us a little bit more about perhaps what challenged you most about producing this book. Well, Seishu, I, I had, I, it was a pretty simple thing. All full professors are sort of invited at Indiana University to do a last lecture about any topic they want. And so I worked during uh, 2016 to kind of gather together um, what I thought was kind of a, a, a significant collection of, of images that sort of defined my career, at least beginning at National Geographic and carrying through my time as a professor at Indiana University. And so I gave in um, uh, April of 2016, I gave my last lecture. And uh, I did a fair amount of research to try to, not to recite old war stories, but to try to have a few themes. Um, 
ethics, uh, covering conflict, who the importance of mentors, um, et cetera, and to uh, also make sure that I understood in a contemporary context um, what's going on today in some of these areas that I photographed 20 or 30 or even 40 years ago. So I gave my last lecture and afterwards, the provost of Indiana University, Lauren Rebell, came up to me and she said, you've got a book. And uh, so I went over, the, the following week I went to the director of Indiana University Press and I, I, had br I brought with him my lecture notes, sort of turned around into chapter outlines with six chapters. And I said, okay, here, here's my chapter outline and here are my pictures on a thumb drive. And it, the idea is pulling together a career that lasts 45 or 50 years with some lessons that were learned the hard way that might be of value to students, mm -hmm. um, some explanation of how it is we do visual journalism mm -hmm. that might be of interest to an even broader audience, some, some good pictures, and also, I think, a pretty substantial discussion of visual, of ethics, where, because it's something I teach. Um, and not just visual ethics, but decision-making, and uh, with, with examples. And so, actually, the whole thing I pulled together, Seishu, and, and from the time we decided to do the book until, the t until we had the book in our hands was only about 18 months. Oh, it wow. was the fastest book I've ever done in my life. And uh, there was a lot of give and take on the individual pictures, and I had to go back to National Geographic and get things rescanned and so forth. Um, but uh, there was also in the back of my mind an effort, Seishu, to get in there in the book as many unpublished pictures that had never seen the light of day as possible, because I think there was certainly a time at National Geographic, and even in more recently in doing books um, for various publishers since I've been a professor, where I was, certainly National Geographic was more content driven. It was what was in the picture rather than how the picture was constructed visually. And, and I gotta say, say she, one of my big failings or faults, uh, because I'm a journalist, is that I still kind of, I, I, content makes a, is a big deal with me. Sure. Um, and uh, so this was an opportunity to say, content is important. But let's look for good pictures or pictures that are really going to make people stop and say, wow, that's visually arresting. And to some extent, I, I went back to National Geographic several times and worked with the archivist. And we actually pulled out these old fashioned yellow boxes uh, that came from Kodak that contained 36 color slides in the box. And I was able to find pictures that I remembered but had never been published before and uh, I'm trying to think there's one particular image somebody asked me to sign uh, my favorite image in the book and it is a mother see if I can get this it's a mother uh, at a uh, in Bangladesh during a horrible famine with her three children and there's a tear in her eye and it never made it into National Geographic but I always remembered the picture I remember taking it um, with the Leica and the 28 or 21 millimeter lens. And I remember that tear in her eye. The funny thing is, is when, and so I found the picture. The interesting thing is when National Geographic made a 100 megabyte drum scan for me, there was a third child there that I had never seen when I photographed it. And when I looked at the color slide in recent times and asked to have it scanned, the child was so deep in the sh shadows of this piece of Kodachrome that I didn't see it, but when it was scanned, clearly there was this third kid. So the old and the new, right? Um, uh, the, new, the new technology made that picture uh, slightly different than what, the way we had seen it in 1975 or 70 wow. when that was going in the magazine. But the idea of, of trying to find some pictures that were arresting to the eye and that we could say wow that's a good picture uh, as opposed to having to tell a story that was driven by content so that was also part of the equation uh, Steve this has been uh, truly electrifying I love I love chatting with you and I miss 
our chats from I from way back when. Too. I miss uh, our chats. I, I, there's so much more that needs to be said, asked, uh, maybe drawn out of you that I wish we had the time. But uh, thank you so much for doing this. The book is called Somewhere West of Lonely. And uh, if you're a photographer, if you're a photojournalist, if you are a visual person who needs uh, that just right kick in the pants and Steve is the right guy to do that for you by the way uh, you, this book this book is really something you need to have in your on your bookshelves to return to again and again to be able to see the pictures which are gorgeous we just talked about how special these photographs are but do yourself a favor and this is a mistake that I've made when I first received the book is that I went right to the photographs I mean obviously as a photographer I'm like oh, let's check out the photographs but Honestly, it's the writing, it's the stories, it's the, the background, it's the history of, uh, of, of Steve's life that makes all the difference. Because as Steve already has mentioned, knowing your, your, your history is so critically important for your own benefit. I mean, you are going to be a better photographer just knowing the giants that have preceded you, you know, and Steve is a giant in the field. Uh, clearly, uh, I have so honored i'm so honored to have known you steve for so many years now uh great to have continued to be in touch with you um thank you i mean that's all i can say is really thank you for for what you've done for me you you've you've touched me Sishu. thank you thank you very much okay yeah indeed, indeed. you're welcome we'll, sir bye thank you take care steve bye-bye take care bye Sishu.